eighth chapter, um, it starts with Arjuna inquired, oh my Lord, oh Supreme Person, what is Brahman? What is the self? What are fruitive activities? What is this material manifestation? And what are the demigods? Please explain this to me. Text two. two. Who is the Lord of sacrifice and how does he live in the body? Oh Madhusudana. And how can those engaged in devotional service know you at the time of death? So as we can see, uh, the focus in this entire chapter is about leaving this world. Um, text three. The Supreme Personality of God had said, the indestructible transcendental living entity is called Brahman and his eternal nature is called Adhyatma, the self. Action pertaining to the development of the material bodies of the living entities is called Karma. So this is the definition of Karma. Mm -hmm. Activities which pertain to the development of the material body of the living entity is called Karma mm -hmm. or fruit of activities. O oh, best text four, O oh, best of the embodied beings, the physical nature which is constantly changing is called Atibhuta, the material manifestation. The universal form of the Lord, which includes all the demigods, like those of the sun and moon, is called Adi Deva. And I, the Supreme Lord, represented as the super soul in the heart of every embodied being, am called Adi Yagya, the Lord of Sacrifice. Text five. Antakale chamami was maran mukwa kale varam yah prayati sa mad bhavam yati nasti atrasam shayaha. And whoever at the end of his life quits his body, remembering me alone, at once attains my nature. Of this there is no doubt. Yam yam vapi smaran bhavam tajam kante kale varam tantame veti kante ya sadat bhava bhavitaha. Whatever state of being one remembers when he quits his body, O son of Kunti, that state he will attain without fail. So maybe we pause here and then we can continue on with our presentation. So the whole entire eighth chapter is um, based on death. And you know, this is where we need your feedback. We would like to know how deep you want to go into the subject matter because we can, you know, we can really kind of spend the next few days um, because in, in actuality, the entire purpose of the Vedas mm. is actually, you know, is, is about learning the art of leaving this world mm. because it's a portal that allows us to, um, you know, enter into the spiritual realm. Mm. So let's start and then we'll see how, how we go and then we'll take, take it from there. So this is, I guess, one of the unfortunate realities of our modern world that we have sort of tucked away this discussion of death. And we have sort of, we don't really want to confront it. We don't want to face it. So it's been sort of sanitized, tucked away in our nursing homes. Every, everything related to death or the journey towards that, like aging or disease, everything, there's a great attempt to hide it and cover it or um, work so that we can actually remove it or, or overcome it mm. rather than accepting it and dealing with it. Mm. Just, uh, I wish there's a way for us to know. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to wrap up the first book, get yeah. on to the next book, but any other major pieces here that we need to cover? Um, in, uh, the subtle arts. Well, we all die, but you know. Yeah, and, and that's interesting <laughs> because this is what I found fascinating because Mark mentions death at the end of this book and yeah. then it opens up the everything is fucked with death, yeah. which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. First of all, no one's talking about death much. And so yeah. I think it's really refreshing that you're talking about it. Actually, we had a guy on named Stephen Jenkins who's got a book called Die Wise, who had, who spent, I think, 10 years in palliative care. And I think he literally watched like two or 3,000 people die. Wow. And he was here to just totally dice and chop up any concept I had of what death was. I kept saying, oh, my relationship with death. And he was just like, would you just stop saying that? <laughs> it's death. <laughs> It's death. And then there's a great book called um, The Denial of Death yeah. and all of that stuff. So talk to me about how this great seller, not getting a fuck, everyone's happy kind of book with you gets into this death and then you open up this book mm -hmm. with death. So tell me about the human relationship with death and how it plays into everything else that's going on. I think it's, first of all, it's 
one of the only things that we're, we, we will all experience, you know, so it, it's crazy that it's not discussed more. I think it's also probably the only thing that we're all afraid of. Uh, you know, it's just one of the most it, it, universal human experiences. And so I, I think it's impossible to not, not, I think that demands that it be talked about. Um, secondly, I think when we, when we come back to talking about this value, what is valuable, what is a meaningful life? I don't think you can properly address that question without imagining death, without mm. imagining what, what it would be like to not be alive. Mm. Um, you, you, like, there's a lot of popular articles and stuff that have gone viral about you know deathbed regrets and on the deathbed and all this stuff. And, and I think the reason that resonates so much is because it's, it's only by thinking about that situation of like, oh crap, if I'm on my deathbed, and I, and I think about what I'm doing today, how would I feel about that? You know, like that gives a sense of clarity um, about our decisions that is often hard to achieve, you know, just in the thinking about it in the present moment. And that's actually um, something that is um, very um, true because, you know, when we kind of do this reverse engineering, right? And we kind of look, to, look into life through this uh, lens then we suddenly are able to filter through what is superfluous and what is of essence, mm. right? We are able to uh, differentiate between, between the essential and the non-essential, mm. which kind of Corona has also brought, mm. you, know, uh, in, you know, in front of us that what is, what is of real value? Mm. And so if we really want to live, um, and we'll talk more about this, how Socrates also addresses the same point, right? Um, and this is the guy he was mentioning about Stephen Jenkinson. And... He also, he starts the conversation, let's talk about death, uh, because we are not talking enough about death. Your death, it doesn't mean you any harm. It's the most faithful companion you'll ever have. The inability to die is one of the things that calls our humanity into deep disrepair. We're death phobic in the extreme. Your dying is your life, and your refusal to know that is not life affirming. It's life betraying. The great consequence of refusing to die well is the corruption of the capacity that others can grow by virtue of attending to your dying. Mm. What will their understanding be of dying then? You'll have another generation with a grudge and a grievance against the natural order of things. In a culture that does not believe in endings, how do they solve heartbreak? The answer is less heart. And that's why the sedation the antidepressants. Where is it written that the best dying is the one you don't notice? Why should dying not break your heart? When you become a practitioner of grief, it stays. I have no idea if I too many parties. <laughs> yeah, and it's true, you know. I think um, I can, I mean, I remember, you know, having seen you know, a few deaths, right, mm. in India. And it really, um, it, 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 it really brings like right in front of you things, you know, that you never ever see. And I guess unless we, and it's not just the final death, but also the so many, as you was mentioning, the heartbreak can happen from so many different things, losing things, things not going our way. And uh, I guess until we reflect on death, we cannot really reflect on, on the spirit. Mm. the spiritual side of things who we who we truly are mm. because when we don't focus on that we're only focusing on the body which is not us that's true and that keeps on going keep on going from one heartbreak to the next that's true <laughs> and also like it's also like like facing our worst fear mm. like i remember like you know early you know when i first like you know got married to you i remember you were telling me that one of the things you tend to do is you look at the worst case scenario mm. and then you go from there mm. so it's like also like if you if you face like they say that you know, it's like the number one fear mm. for people, right? It's just so subconscious within us. Um, and so once we are able to look at it mm. and think about it and, and prepare ourselves, mm. then we can actually um, truly live a life uh, which is uh, not based on fear. Mm. So. so exactly. So this is what, you know, Socrates, uh, he once asked his uh, disciples, his students that, uh, how do you know if mm. a man is happy? Mm. And so different people gave um, different responses. Um, somebody said, well, if someone has very good health 
And somebody else said, well, if someone has a lot of money and you know, just all the different ways that we try to determine if someone has actually lived a happy life. And uh, Socrates' response to this was that, well, you know, a man is happy by the way he dies, mm. right? So then you know that that person has actually lived a happy life. So, so you know, it's kind of interesting that the entire Srimad Bhagavatam, right, is a book. It's an enci encyclopedic book about the art of dying. And it all started with this question of this great king, the grandson of Arjuna, uh, who was cursed to die. And then he assembled, um, he just went to this shore of Ganges and then he, and he had this conversation with the great sage Sukha, where he asked him, what is the duty of a person who is about to die? And, and the whole, this encyclopedia was spoken in answer to this question. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, while we have on the one hand, this idea of, you know, death denial, right? De de you know, we, we don't really want to face death. Uh, there's also a lot of, I mean, we were surprised that, you know, how much money is actually being pumped into this immortality project. Yeah. And uh, this, I guess, uh, our pursuit of immortality in artificial ways is, is, a, is, is, is a way of denying death. And, uh, I guess, and people are hopeful that maybe one day we'll become immortal. So let's see how close we are. Where your lifespan is double, even triple what it is now. A world sure a society where 66 is the new 16. Where your lifespan is double, even triple what it is now. A world where you could watch science fiction become reality. Where your body will never fail you. A world where age really is just a number. Labs all over the world are working to get to the bottom of longevity, unlocking the secrets to extending our lifespans well into our hundreds and beyond. They think it's the greatest unsolved problem in biology. So how close are we to immortality? So I guess one way to look at this whole problem or deal with the problem of death is, is, is to see this as a problem mm. that, or, or that can be solved through science and technology and then through our brain power. But this is one approach many people are taking in order to deal with death. Also, you know, you know, just to, um, I guess, just to be kind, you mm -hmm. know, this quest for immortality really stems from the fact that mm -hmm. we are actually immortal. Actually immortal, right? So, you know, to us, this whole idea of dying is just not something that the soul has really nothing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, just like we, we read in the second chapter, the soul never dies, you know, so it's such an artificial imposition in one sense. But I guess we are trying to solve it on the level of matter, mm. which is why we keep getting frustrated. But yeah, you know. this person Dmitri Iskov, he's is like a great, uh, great internet uh, founders and uh, from Russia, and, and he has uh, created this project 2045, where his goal is that by 2045 everybody can be immortal. And his approach is that we can somehow transplant our brain into robot, uh, our mind into robots so that uh, even our physical body may die, but then our mind has moved on to this robot who will be us. Mm. So let's kind of hear from him what he's planning to do. Lovely, Congress. It's too discuss how to evolve, uh, how can our physical body evolve and how can consciousness evolve. It is very important because uh, now we are facing the time where unconscious evolution period uh, has almost finished and we come to the new era when new per period of control of human evolution can happen. I think that main efforts of their uh, scientists and main technological progress will be concentrated on their making new body for the human being. So the first step is to make human-like robot, which we call avatar, and to make their perfect control system via brain-computer interface. The second step will be to uh, develop uh, their system of human brain life support and to connect it to the avatar so disabled people and people who are at the edge of dying can uh, enhance their lifespan. And the third one, uh, I mean the third project, project, finally making the artificial brain to which we can transfer the individual consciousness. And we have one more project, which is actually our dream. It is uh, producing hologram-like avatar bodies. What I think is that technology is not the kind of... 
so you know just to get a sense of like how how much we want to just you know in one way or the other and there's so much, there's so much hope and there's so much planning going on and and it's, it's all good at least it's forcing people to think about our mortality and this is another there's a big uh, <laughs> kind of a effort going on amongst the ultra rich to live forever mm-hmm. so let's hear from some of the big guys what they are planning to do the french playwright eugen ionesco once asked why was i born if it wasn't forever mm-hmm. but life if anything is impermanent flowers die stars die and you will die so if you can't defeat death what if you could postpone it or at least postpone the diseases commonly associated with getting old many people especially the ultra wealthy in silicon valley are investing money into companies trying to answer exactly those questions richest man in the world jeff bezos and billionaire paypal co-founder peter thiel have both invested in the space in 2013 google formed aging research company calico there's also bioage bioviva the longevity fund hx the methusela foundation and many others whenever you meet a fundamental human need there's a market and in this case the market for age related disease in aging Uh, it is a trillion dollar market. Trillion. Billionaire Oracle co-founder Larry Ellison has donated hundreds of millions of dollars to aging research. Bulletproof founder Dave Asprey has spent more than a million dollars hacking his own biology. I right now am expecting to live to about 180. I think that's very achievable assuming a truck doesn't hit me. <laughs> People claiming to know what you ought to do to live longer is not anything new. Historically, as is still the case today, a lot of it just doesn't work. This medicine is a fake. Yes, I'm a fake. Yakov's a fake. This is no good. I did it with a witch cheating all the people, don't you see? From selling dietary supplements to stem cell injections, there is already a huge amount of money being made. Right now in San Francisco for $8,000 you can get a liter of blood from 16 to 25 year olds injected into your body. By one estimate the global anti-aging market could surpass $271 billion dollars by 2024. Mm-hmm. Goals vary too from trying to add decades to your life to simply trying to extend the years your body remains healthy. So what's real because there really is new science worth being excited about. and what's just wishful thinking or straight up snake oil surpassing can you stop it interesting to all the medical specialists in all of the hospitals of the globe who's going to be the first to buy a wonderful bottle of pyrazol if you look around <laughs> <laughs> so then you can watch this whole thing you know it's a 30 uh, it's a 17 minute long so we obviously cannot watch the whole thing but you know just to kind of um, you know get this idea and these are you know some immortals that you know who try to be mortal and uh, who uh, basically succumb to i guess uh, you can see that how this effort to overcome death has has been going on forever this uh, great king king shi huang uh, he's very famous for building the great wall of china and then the terracotta warriors he built, uh, he constructed the terracotta warriors so that um, they can protect him from death and then he sent one of his very confidential uh, uh, ministers to find this elixir of life and uh, incidentally that the minister never came back and in order to live forever this uh, king he he basically took uh, many many pills of mercury or something maybe some at that time they thought that they can achieve immortality and then this king died in great pain because of taking those pills uh, and same thing with this uh, politician in america leonard forever jones uh, who believed that by fasting and an austerity and morality he he could overcome death i mean that was at least i mean at least one uh-huh. conceptually not a bad approach and um, he actually i think won in the election or something but then he that year he he died oh, oh yeah one, yeah his effort was that if i if i win then i'll pass on my immortality to the the people who voted for me oh really yeah, yeah. and and then but he incidentally the same year he died of pneumonia hmm. It's funny that even in the Shrimad Bhagavatam, there's actually a story of uh, a great king called mm. Hiranyakashipu, mm. who also had a very similar ambition. And so he actually went and performed great, you know, yogic, uh, uh, you know, meditation austerity, right? Mm. And uh, he actually was able to invoke Lord Brahma, who is the secondary engineer. And when he when he appeared in front of him, he said, "What do you want? You know, you can get a 
you know, benediction of Boon. And he said, I want to be immortal. And he said, I cannot grant you immortality, immortality because I myself am not immortal. So what he tried to do was he tried to circumvent death. So he said that, give me a boon that uh, I will not be killed by any man. Uh, no, I, I won't be killed by any man, animal or, or demigod. Hmm. So Brahma said, yes, give me the boon that I won't be killed inside or outside. So Brahma said, okay. And then he said, give he said, me a boon that I won't be killed in the day or in the night. He yeah. said, okay. And he said, give me a boon that I won't be killed inside. Um, or inside in, on, on the land or on the sky. Yeah. So he said, all right. So he thought that I'm covering all my bases, <laughs> right? So now how, how, who's going to come and kill me? So it's a very nice, you know, story of Lord Krishna appearing as nourishing. I will talk about and it. And he satisfies all his requirements and yet he kills him. <laughs> uh -huh. Because he has a very, he was a big demon. Like he really harassed, you know, abused his son who was five years old. And who happened to be, so his whole purpose was that he had a God syndrome, right? Mm. So he wanted to like have everyone worship him and, you know, just a really like a tyrant. And he achieved complete control because of the, the boons he got. He achieved con complete control of all the five elements. Mm. So earth, water, fire, air, uh, space, he had complete control of them. He could manipulate all the laws of nature. So, and, but he still had to die. So what it proves that, I mean, our efforts to manipulating nature and uh, anti-aging, they're nothing compared to what mm -hmm. Hina achieved. That's nice. So this was, uh, you know, Prabhupada was known uh, for his uh, witty remarks. And so one time when Prabhupada was uh, in America, you know, there was a, a journalist who uh, tried to kind of, you know, ask Prabhupada that, so, so Swamiji, you know, we believe that the death rate in India is very high. You know, and so Prabhupada's response was like, the death rate is the same everywhere. It's 100%. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so the point being that, um, you know, it's, um, it's just, it's something that Krishna speaks about that whoever is born uh, in this material world is, is, is bound to die. And we have a phrase, as sure as death, mm. right? So it's the one thing that we can be certain about that we may, we can perhaps extend our lifespan from maybe 100, you know, 200, 300, doesn't matter. But the point is that um, it, it has to come to an end because that's the nature of matter. So this is a story of Buddha. I guess, again, this brings out that we are not only uncomfortable dealing with death, but death always brings a lot of grief. Mm. And we want to, I guess, our inner desire is if somebody who has died, can we bring them back to life? Mm. Right? So Same. It, it kind of, we have a desire to upset the, the natural order of things. So there was, you know, one time, uh, you know, this lady uh, who had just lost her, her son, uh, she came to her name was Kisha Gautami and her only son died, infant son, yeah. infant son died. So she was obviously very distraught. And so she went to Buddha and see, she was crying, you know, in front of him. So he said, all right, you can, you know, go, you know, go to somebody's house. Mm -hmm. And if you can get me some mustard seeds, I can actually bring him back to life. And she thought that, oh, what's the big deal? You know, a little bit of mustard seed from by begging. Um, and But I guess there was a condition where from a household where no one has ever died before, mm. right? So that was the, um, that was what Buddha wanted. So she thought that should not be too difficult. Mm. So, so she said, well, I'll do what you say. And she goes and she starts begging door to door. And, um, and then when she approaches every every door, you know, somebody says, oh, I'm so, so you know, I, I'm sorry, I would love to give you some mustard seeds, but I cannot because, you know, my, you know, uncle or my mother-in-law or this person or that person, there was always someone mm -hmm. <laughs> who had died. So like that, she realizes after a while. She that... realizes that. And then she comes back to Buddha and she really, you know, she submits that I, I now realize that, you know, death is inevitable. So, you know, what can be done? In fact, I, I was just thinking, you know, when I, when I heard the story, mm -hmm. something kind of similar happened to me. This was right after um, I got married to Loka. And um, it's a tradition in, um, in, in, in traditional societies. And, you know, my mother-in-law, when I, when I went back, like I, I, I remember, you know, the first time. So when you're newly wed and the mother-in-law kind of, there are so many houses, mm. right. In the, in the, in the community. So, you know, I, I sort of had to go with my mother-in-law and visit every single family, every single, single relative, friend, whatever, you know, and then, then you kind of, you know, they, they invite you and they feed you and blah, blah, blah. So I, I had to go with my mother-in-law and I was newly married. Right. Mm. And every household I would go to, 
you know they would they would sit down like initially they would do some small talk and they would right right away get into like you know disease and death mm. and i was and i you know for me this happened over and over well, and over because somebody is dying yeah because house. it's just the way of life right mm. so like you know like they would sit down and they would start start chit chatting and they'd go i know that person is not doing well you know this person has this disease and this person just died and this person is you know it was just i mean that was it mm. and then I, i and for me it was like oh you know it was like a reality check because you know um you know i was only 24 but then i could see that oh there is a whole other reality you know mm. which is also there and and so sometimes when we encounter this same thing happened with buddha actually that's how he became buddha mm. right is his father didn't want him to ever encounter any kind of death or suffering or disease mm. and he kept him enclosed in a palace but then when he finally when he saw you know that there is disease and that there is you know death that's what awakened him mm. to wanting to find out what's really going on so very very powerful experiences so uh we'll probably end with this this is actually a very very interesting chapel i would love to visit this chapel it's in portugal <laughs> and it's called the chapel of the bones and uh <laughs> and this is uh made this was made by franciscan um uh, monks uh, who wanted to really bring people's attention to the the real purpose of chapel why why are we here so the doorway to the chapel says in i think in portuguese we bones that are here awaits your so what they did was uh, one of the other reasons this chapel was made actually was that um, lack the of space, huh? lack of space yeah. in the cemeteries and instead of just throwing away the the bones uh, what they did was they brought all the bones inside the this chapel and uh, fit all the skeletons and all the bones on the walls of the chapel so let's take a look at this chapel it is a poem yeah, yeah. after this <laughs> All these walls, these all skulls. It looks very morbid. Did you see this? Who were these people, and how how did they die? So how did the bones end up here? How many skulls do you think are in here? Should, Should we try counting? <laughs> yes, I can do it. Okay. Go ahead. Trap below the bones. Oh. Above the door it says stop here and think of this fate that will befall you. The bones belong to the monks who were buried in the cemetery which was formerly around the church. Only part of the cemetery behind the church was removed. This chapel was constructed as a memory of the first. It has 1245 skulls. The chapel of the bones is 1816 it's certainly something we've never seen before right like this is my aunt maria <laughs> so um, there's a beautiful poem that is written in the, in the chapel so it says where are you going in such a hurry traveler stop do not proceed you have no greater concern than this one that on which you focus your sight recall how many have passed from this world reflect on your similar end there is good reason to reflect if only all did the same ponder you so influenced by fate among the many concerns of the world so little do you reflect on death if by chance you glance at this place stop for the sake of your journey the more you pause the more you will progress hmm. by father Prince, father antonio di essenzio beautiful so yeah it's very beautiful so i guess it's um you know we'll continue this tomorrow we have there's oh, so okay. much we have so much material on this subject and if you guys are feeling enlivened by this topic we are very happy to talk about this so <laughs> the chapel looks morbid though with all the skulls and bones Actually this was a uh, you know a, this was a practice that uh, was also employed by uh, Franciscan monks um there are many many uh, such monasteries even in Europe mm-hmm. where they would actually preserve these uh, uh these skulls and skeletons and would actually uh, perform their meditation uh, just to you know bring to attention uh, that this body is temporary mm-hmm. and and it's and you know it would help their 
uh, spiritual practices. Mm. So I think it's just a way of meditating on death. Comments. Well, actually, even along with that, I, I find that, you know, like I remember I have a very close friend and uh, one time it so happened that uh, I was in India and her uh, father passed away mm. and she called me uh, in the morning and she said, you know, can you please just come? And I said, yeah. So I, I you know, remember I went over and her father's body was lying on the ground mm. and, and she was obviously distraught. And so she and I, we sat together and we recited the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita and we recited many more chapters. And I have to say that the Bhagavad Gita that day took on a much deeper meaning for me. Mm. As we were reading those verses, you know, it was just so, um, it yeah, it was just so real, you know, at that time. And it really went really deep. So there is something to be said about, um, you know, um, about this, uh, this idea. <laughs> uh, so we'll just read your comments and then we'll see what you guys want to do. So due to, so, uh, yes, the worst case scenario rarely happens. So if you can accept the worst case scenario, we can add boldly. Look at it as someday will be my going home day. Lord, keep me ready for my call. <laughs> Beautiful Pratibha. Mm -hmm. um, problems are over. Ironically, death is a very inspiring topic to provide us an impetus to live an authentic and life from the lift from the heart. Thank mm -hmm. you for bringing this topic. I've heard the first person to live to be 150 has already been born. Well, mm -hmm. won't help if, help you if a tree falls on you in a storm, though. There will never be absolute control over <laughs> death. Nice. Dominic, this doesn't seem like it would work for me because I feel like a part of consciousness um is found in the heart not only in the this mind is in, in response to the yeah the Russians uh, attempt to go exactly and that's absolutely right that our consciousness actually resides within the heart mm. right so all of these attempts uh even though the attempt itself is um is is praiseworthy it means that you want to get past you know this limited sphere of space and time yeah like ravana one of the great demons uh asuras um he wanted to make a stairway to heaven, basically saying that in the same body, you can go to heaven, which means you can conquer death. Mm. But he never succeeded, actually. That was Prabhu says, on the contrary to living forever, I would just like the opposite as I've realized how I wasted my golden years in useless acts. Hopefully I can start fresh on a good note in the next life. <laughs> yeah, and that's true. You know, death is also like a reset button, mm. right? Allows us to, of course, in one sense, it's not, you know, you just continue on. But in other sense, you know. It's... And in that sense, uh, like even today can be the start of our new life. Yeah. And death is just like walking out of one door and entering another house. Yeah. Tapas true. Let's continue death as long as possible. Yeah, I love this is, uh, you know, there's just so much we can, you know, spend some time and we'll take it, you know, see. Yes, we're enlivened by the death topic. Good, good, good. So thank you. thank you. So any questions or comments on, you know, what we did so far? It's 837. So we'll stop here and continue the rest tomorrow. I have a question. Yeah. Um, in the Christian Bible, I believe in the Old Testament, um, some people have calculated or put up the theory that people's longevity used to be a lot longer. So they say that, um, like, the, the people that that book talks about uh, maybe lived like 200, 300 years and i'm just wondering if the vedanta has something similar yeah in in, in uh in other vedic cycle yuga cycle we have sata yuga uh, preta yuga dwapar yuga and the kali yuga now so in sata yuga the lifespan is hundred thousand years in in treta yuga the lifespan is ten thousand years in dwapar yuga which in which krishna appeared arjuna appeared the lifespan was um, one thousand years and in today's Kali Yuga, the maximum lifespan is considered 100 years, which nobody lives, I mean, hardly pure, anybody lives. Pure, yeah. Pure life. yeah. So, yeah, that is, and that's actually one of the reasons why, uh, you know, we hear in the Vedic tradition, people being able to perform meditation and austerity for thousands of years, and you go like, how is that even possible? Mm. Uh, but, but, you know, for us, you know, obviously we cannot do that. So that's why, you know, for each uh, Yuga or each uh, cycle, there are different recommended processes. And, the Did lifespan you know? is decreasing in, even within Kali Yuga. Bhagavatam says that uh, uh, when Kali Yuga progresses later on, somebody who, who lives for 20, 30 years, they will be considered like a grand old person. Uh, but that's like towards the yeah. latter. I mean, we just, we are only like 5,000 sort of years. No, 500 uh, years into Kali Yuga. 5,000 years. Oh, 5,000. Yeah, yeah, years into Kali Yuga, right? So. You're waiting for Kalki to come and kill us all. <laughs> no, no, we don't have to. Will be will hopefully. Uh -huh. 
So thank you. Anybody else? Any other comment or Dominic, do you have any thoughts? Um, well, I, I mostly just thought how it was interesting. Like I was, you know, thinking about death because a friend of mine had, you know, another friend of mine who was the same age, I'm 20, um, you know, die. And I think about circumstance and, and um, like karmic relations and trying to understand death in the way that it impacts the other people, you know, that are left behind in this space of matter in the material world. And um, yeah, like emotionally, I think it's really hard to kind of process that. And it's definitely a journey in itself to detach um, from that idea and to have a different perspective on death. Um, so I definitely appreciate these talks and uh, trying to just gain a better understanding. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I think um, you're right. That I think it has two aspects. I think the one aspect is, you know, us leaving and the fear that is attached to that. And the, and the other is the aspect of our loved ones leaving and the grief, right, that is attached to that. And they're both equally hard. I mean, one could even say maybe the second one is even harder, mm. you know, at some level, because one has to be, look, here, one, be here, right? Be the pain. Yeah. And, and yet, um, you know, we can also maybe spend some time and talk about that, that um, there is a way that we can, um, you know, life is very powerful. The force of the current of life is very powerful. And There's a beautiful story in Bhagavatam, maybe we'll read that, how this great king mm. um, dies and then his wives are lamenting like anything on his dead body. And the, actually, the the, the, the god of death, death, the lord of death, Yamaraj, he comes as a young child, and, and then he gives his knowledge to his wife. Uh, Maybe we'll read that. We'll read that. That's a beautiful story. We will. We'll, we'll spend some time. So thank you for bringing that out. Yes, it will help everyone. Uh, Anshul and Chita, do you have any thought? Hare Krishna, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Uh, just just a reflection um i mean the idea of death the thought of death still gives jitters in the mind mm -hmm. probably because we are still attached to the material world we are not detached with the family it's still emotional part that's that's there and yeah it brings fear brings fears all together mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and and that's that's i guess that's what krishna is trying to do is is to not like push away that fear, mm. uh, but rather accepting that fear, recognizing that fear and dealing with that fear head on with knowledge and with practice, suitable practice. And I, and I guess we're doing that. Uh, I mean, I, I'm already feeling like just by talking about that for the last 30 minutes, uh, I'm feeling like a change in, in my consciousness mm. that, oh, what is, what is important to me? What yeah. is really important to me? Yeah. And I think, uh, and of course it is fearful and, and therefore we want to tuck it away, but let's face it. And it, the more we face it, the more I think there are so many rough edges in, in our life, in every single aspect of our life, in our relationships, in what we desire, what we want, our ambitions, how we deal with different situations in life. I think all of them can be kind of fine-tuned and uh, aligned with our uh, real goal when, when we think about that. I think there are studies, um, uh, Anchita, that shows that um, uh, when people actually approach this uh, discussion, mm. it actually makes them happier and more peaceful. Mm. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but... Um, it's like shedding a weight. Yeah, it's like sh shedding a weight. And also for us, it's actually even more, uh, and I'm kind of giving away the sort of the discussion ahead, but it's even more relevant because uh, for devotees, um, there is absolutely, um, um, you know, like there's a beautiful story of Dhruva, you know, in Srimad Bhagavatam, it will come to that. Okay, he doesn't want me to give it away. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's it's especially relevant for uh, practitioners of bhakti because uh, for us, it's a, it's um, it's it's not the all devouring energy mm. of Krishna. Mm. It is actually uh, an embrace. You and know? I think when we look at it, we can actually derive. We, we think of death as as an end, mm -hmm. right? Where all energy is, is gone and now everything is gone. But we can derive so much energy from death while we are living mm -hmm. it's like a reverse like a reverse energy uh, feeder i mean we can think of it that yeah and actually it's interesting because you know one of Prabhupada's, you know Prabhupada's name is abhai charan mm -hmm. which means one who is completely fearless so it brings us to this place of fearlessness and uh, and also um, uh, 
uh, it's very glorious. I think Ganeshan Prabhu is asking a question about, uh, this is Ganeshan, was there any incident in Purana's Vedic literature where death is glorified, celebrated so much? Mm. I mean, I love the story of Vrita Sura from mm. Srimad Bhagavatam. And here is Vrita Sura who is faced, he knows he's going to die and he's on this battlefield, he's fighting Indra and he knows his, you know, his, you know, there's no way he can win this battle. We, we have so many stories from Bhagavatam celebrating death, we'll share them. We'll share them. You know, this is actually something we should stay with for some time yeah. because it's so amazing. And then what to speak of the Puranas, uh, even in our own movement, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of my favorite uh, things that I love to read are the, um, you know, like whenever a devotee leaves their mm -hmm. body, oh my goodness. Even in current times. Current times. Like right now, as we speak, we have a devotee, her name is Krishna Nandini, and um, she's actually preparing to leave her body. She she's has, diagnosed with terminal cancer. And yeah. you have to just watch her. And we'll show you videos. There's Bhakti Tirth Swami. He was back in the day, many of you actually didn't get a chance to see him. He left, left his body right here. And uh, he was amazing. Like his, We'll show a video of him, how he was like right, right near death. And that person is, is uh, talking like a lion. So um, these are very inspiring stories. Very inspiring. So we, we, we just like uh, what uh, Delia was saying, right? It may seem these stories, that these stories are far away from us, mm. but they're actually right within our, our reach also. Mm. And in fact, uh, Bhakti Tirth Swami, um, there was another Maharaj, another uh, devotee, Radhanath Swami, he was taking care of him. And, and he had melanoma cancer. Uh, he was African American. You and don't want to give it to me. You don't want to give it. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm just in that today. I'm just like, you know, no. Ha, I have it. a question. Yes, yes. Um, so, the the process of you know a child coming into the world yeah. is is a um, you know that's one process. It's not easy, and then the process of life going out of our body, the you know death. So, in our lifetime. Does our karma influence um, our our death? Does our karma influence our death? Yes, it can if we are just working according to the laws of karma. Um, if if that's that's what you know. So if someone is just allowing these these mechanical laws of karma to act in our life, then absolutely our death is going to be controlled by the laws of karma. But as soon as one makes a shift and moves their their life track on a spiritual track, then they are no longer controlled by karma. And right? although death will be there because we have a body, uh, death is, is just, I guess maybe we should also talk about next time what is death because we haven't really defined death yet. Mm -hmm. So what is really death? And so many definitions of death are there. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes people will say that someone had a very peaceful death versus somebody mm -hmm. who really suffered a lot. So is that something that is controlled by our, yes. you know, our yes. karma? Definitely. Yes, definitely it is karma. And, and then I guess we also have to define what is real peace. Mm. Because, you know, sometimes people will say, oh yeah, he just passed away in his sleep. Mm. But I guess what we miss in that, in that talk is what was the consciousness? Where mm. was the consciousness at? And depending on, and this again, we, you know, we'll talk about it, you know, Krishna speaks in this section that wherever our consciousness is fixed is where we will go in our next life. So, you know, real auspicious death is being able to direct, you know, our destination, mm. right? Beyond the sphere of this, uh, this world actually is called Mrityu Samsara. Mrityu Lok. Mrityu Lok, which means that it's the, lo it's the, it's the world of death. So to, and, and for the soul, that's an unnatural place. Mm. So we'll talk more, but yes, you're right. Karma does play a big part for most people. Amrita, I was wondering the same thing. Is everyone's death predetermined? Yes. Death is predetermined, uh, but Krishna can always interfere. So if somebody um, starts whatever his connection with God, then um, he can adjust if he if he wills. Um, but uh, the bottom line is everybody has to die still. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, they say that it is. You know, how many breaths we have, mm. um, they're you know predetermined, but. But once we surrender to Krishna, then karma stops acting. And so now it's completely up. And that's actually, I don't know, Delia, can you confirm that? Because astrologers do tell us that, you know, when you go to an astrologer and you're a practicing devotee, they say, well, for you, you know, we cannot really, um, can you speak, can you speak to that with your knowledge of astrology? Uh, I don't know very much about the topic of death specifically. There are some indicators that can indicate um, like a more natural death or an untimely death. 
or like a more like a not you know like illness and and stuff like that i think that a chuta bhava generally uh steers us away from making hard wired death predictions yeah. for people but then i've also heard that um Indian or Vedic astrologers uh, are a lot more willing to go there, oh. <laughs> you know, than the Western astrologers. But um, it freaks people out because um, if you like, if an astrologer tells you like you're, yeah. you know, you're only going to live until your 35th birthday, and then your 35th birthday is coming, that's got to freak you out. You don't know if it's true or not. That's my boyfriend. Hold on, <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. So there is some karma there, but then also it's not so easy to predict it. Mm -hmm.